so and we look forward to, to your input throughout. Um, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, it's such sort of a weird way for a rural Recording Vermont. Recording in progress. For rural Vermont to meet, um, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, both uh, to meet the staff, meet the board members, and to elect new board members, and also um, to do significant changes to our bylaws. Um, I hope you've had time to review the strategic plan, um, which has been an incredible process to go through for all of us. I think we've learned a lot, um, and I hope you can appreciate the work that we've put into it. Um, Right now, I'd like to introduce the staff. Um, our legislative director for Rural Vermont is Carolyn. Uh, so she, she uh, were you gonna keep up the picture of the staff? Now, well, Carolyn's waving. Okay, great. Um, Emma is our operations director. There she is. Molly Wills is the grassroots organizer. Uh, Graham is our policy director. Hey, everybody. And, Shel <laughs> and Shelby is the development director. Uh, they're an incredible staff. Um, they work really hard for all of us. Um, and I hope you all appreciate them tremendously. Um, and I'd like to introduce our current board members. Uh, and I can't see everyone on the screen, but I'll call your name and maybe just give a wave. Uh, so Ryan and Rachel Yoder, they're, they're a team. Uh, let's see. Hi. Oh, good. <laughs> No picture, uh, no picture, Ryan. No, I got it fixed. Look at that. Oh, wow. Great. There he is. Uh, Ms. Took. Uh, Jeannie Bartlett. Hey, everyone. There's Glad Jeannie. to see you. Uh, Chris Wood. Hello. And Sue Buckholz. Hi. And me, Julie, Kat Buxton. Hi, everybody. And John Cleary. Hi, folks. Glad to be here. Corey Pierce. I'm here in audio. <laughs> oh, good. Thanks, Corey. Um, and Celine Is Celine on? I, I don't have everyone on my screen. Maybe she'll be joining us later. Later. Um, also with us is Keith Drinkwine, who's been on the, the board for a couple of years and served as our treasurer, done an incredible job um, working in the financial, um, with the financial aspects of Rural Vermont. Um, and the other member who is not present, I don't think is Christine from the islands. Um, we do have three outgoing board members. Uh, Keith will not be running for re-election. Uh, we will miss him terribly. Um, also Meredith Niles and Nick Ziegelbaum, who are not with us tonight, but they will not be running for re-election either. Um, we really thank them all for their years with Rural Vermont. Um, their, their um, input has been incredible. Um, and there they are on the shared screen. Um, Meredith works for UVM. She's been really thoughtful in all of her contributions to rural Vermont. Um, Keith has um, works part at the Intervale and also has a Flatlander, Flatlander farm. Um, and, and Nick is from Southern Vermont. We haven't seen a lot of him, but um, he was past president um, and uh, we've appreciated his, his contributions. Um, so now I think I'll pass it on to Chris to handle the elections of new board members. Um, 
and the re-election of a number of us. And he can explain it all to you. Thank we you for hope, coming. We hope I can explain it all. I'm, go I'm going to try and if, and if I sort of steer off of course, uh, do let me know. Um, but so here, oh, so up here on the, on the screen, it's showing uh, the rules for the elections. So we're gonna vote for everybody at once. That's the, including the new and the, and the, um, the renewing members all at once. Uh, the board, board terms are for two years. And I think you'll hear this probably over and over again tonight, only Rural Vermont members are eligible in the, to vote. And the votes will by, be by yay or nay. Um, so I think the first thing to do is uh, to introduce the new board members and hopefully have them each say something a little bit short about themselves. Um, and I do have a note that it's possible that John Turner, who was one of the candidates, um, probably is either not uh, he's not here now and may join us later, but he also may not. Um, but if, but we'll let let's start with uh, Noah. No, Noah, do you want to say a few words or, uh, about yourself? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me in this meeting and putting me up for um, election to the board. Um, I'm definitely a little bit starstruck, a little bit nervous and you know, have some feelings of imposter syndrome because there's so many amazing, you know, and influential pe people on the board and as members of R rural Vermont. So I'm very honored. Um, I'm just somebody coming from uh, New York City, New Jersey, suburban, urban area. Um, definitely didn't grow up with a connection to my local farms and local farmers um, growing up, let alone you know, having a lot of access to outdoor recreational opportunities. But I, you know, although that wasn't in my direct vicinity, I always felt a strong connection and admiration for it. Um, <clears throat> fast forward through high school, I kept those same passions and through a family friend vacation, first found um, Vermont, found Lake Champlain, found Burlington, and just instantly <clears throat> fell in love with the beauty, with the people, and knew that I wanted to, at least for a time, live here. So I went to St. Michael's College for my undergrad studying environmental studies, <clears throat> excuse me, environmental studies and biology. Um, in that time, I had an internship with uh, Vermont EPSCOR looking at adoption of best management practices. So that was kind of the first workings into agricultural sciences, ecological economics for me. Um, after St. Michael's undergrad, I was able to uh, get a research graduate research assistantship um, at Plymouth State University at, with a master's of science in environmental science and policy, um, leading a contingent valuation survey, looking at how local residents of the Great Bay Estuary in uh, the seacoast area of New Hampshire, how local residents were valuing ecosystem services and why they were doing so. Um, in the summers and kind of late springs in between, I had, I was very fortunate to be working at Shelburne Farms in the children's farmyard, in the market garden, in the education sector, and just really fell in love with Shelburne Farms also, and just kind of the intersections between community engagement, um, agricultural education, you know, knowing your farmer, all the, all the values that Shelburne Farms embodies. Um, and so that I consider Shelburne Farms another second home to me. Um, after grad school, Shelburne Farms in Vermont kept pulling me back. I did a postgraduate education fellowship at Shelburne Farms. Um, and then afterwards, I had the amazing opportunity to go to the Peace Corps in Jamaica um, about eight months after Shelburne Farms. Um, and that was 
farming every day, working with farmers every day, uh, working in rural populations and just kind of growing that love and admiration and respect for farmers and the hard work they do and the need for advocacy and um, innovation into their daily lives to keep up with climate change, to keep up with other economic sectors. Um, and then as you know, we all have been dealing with the pandemic hit, we were all evacuated. Um, all Peace Corps volunteers around the world. I wasn't ready to give up playing in the dirt. So <clears throat> really, since that time up until just about a month ago, I've kind of been full time farming and maple sugaring and just kind of staying outside. Um, this past February, through rural Vermont, I was given the uh, BIPOC, uh, BIPOC farmers in soil health uh, stipend. And through that was able to join the Payment for Ecosystem Services Small Farmers Working Group. And that was last February. And that was, that was the last piece that I was missing. I had the hands-on farming work, um, but I wanted to be engaging my mind a little bit more back into what I had gone to school for. Um, that's been an amazing group. I've been able to stay up to date on different uh, program, Vermont farmer programs and legislation. And then kind of with, honestly, uh, I feel a little bit of mentor, mentorship from Carolyn um, in rural Vermont, was able to kind of push me to stick with it, push me to keep going. And I was able to get a research assistant position with the Payment for Ecosystem Services working group. Um, and lastly, kind of my greatest, my biggest joy and passion and involvement right now is I was the founder and co-manager of the People's Farm Stand, um, which is basically a pay what you can payment optional farm stand operating in Pomeroy Park in Burlington and the South Meadows neighborhood, which is largely a low income and refugee resettlement neighborhood, um, getting produce from up to six farms we have signed on now. It's been really amazing to see how excited the farmers are about it, to see how excited the recipients are. And that's, that's been really fulfilling. Um, thank you all again so much. Wow. No, I'm, I'm starstruck. <laughs> that's pretty impressive. <laughs> um, great. Um, uh, th thanks Noah. Um, okay. Next. Um, Mariah, could you give us some words of, on your background? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Maria. Um, I use they and she pronouns. Really nice to meet you, Noah, um, and everyone else. I work for Stratford Organic Creamery, mostly on the farm side. Um, so most of my job is being a dairy farm worker. But then on the side of that, I also run a dried flower um, business and I grow and dry and arrange um, certified organic flowers. So I interned for Rural Vermont back in 2016 and I'm just really excited to, to get more involved again um, and, and to help Rural Vermont with all their work around food justice, whether that's for farmers, farm workers or the climate. Um, I'm really excited to be involved. So thank you. Wow, thank you, thank you very much. And I, I'm sensing that we don't have John. I don't hear John, so, so I've been given a little short um, description of, for John's background to read to you, which I will do now. Um, John Turner. Uh, in 2014, John began to utilize the agricultural landscape as a classroom for community members interested in resilient food systems through service learning projects, internships, and site visits for K-12 to, K to college students and military veterans. He is the founding and former chair of the Vermont State Chapter of the Farm Farmer Veteran Coalition, recipient of the National Farm to School Innovations Grant, former NOFA Vermont board member, and currently operates Wild Roots Community Farm 
in Bristol, Vermont. So those are the three new uh, candidates for the board. And um, now we turn to the current board members who are up for re-election. And, oh, there you go, wow. And then the picture shows up. I don't have to do any work. Um, uh, Kat, Kat Buxton, who is at the top, you know, right in order, um, Sue Buckholtz, Julie Walcott, Oh, it's, they're even in order. How impressive. Um, <laughs> Ryan and Rachel wrote Yoder, and they, they are one seat for anybody who's sort of confused. The, the couple is, counts as a single seat. Um, myself, Chris Wood, and Jeannie Bartlett. So now, we go to the full screen and uh, we get to vote on the entire slate, which is the three new members and those six returning positions that I just described. And I, the idea I think is that we have a voice vote. Um, is that, should we do it by voice? In which case everybody all of all together has to unmute. And I will say all those in favor say yay. And then uh, all those opposed nay. So for, if you can unmute, if you're, I, this is for again, rural Vermont members, <coughs> official members only. So um, all those in favor say yay. 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 <laughs> and, uh, and all those opposed say uh, nay or no. Um, all, those, uh, all those opposed. No it's surprise. Anonymous. Thank you very much. Congratulations. We now have the 2022 um, uh, board. So thank you very much. And now I get to pass it back to Shelby. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to, to welcome and congratulate our new members. Uh, and also uh, <clears throat> to welcome back so many really wonderful um, board members who have served over the last few years as well. We're going to switch gears a little bit now um, and get started on the next vote that we will invite all of our, our members to participate in. And this is um, <clears throat> a, a pretty big update that we are proposing making to rural Vermont's bylaws. Um, <clears throat> hopefully you all have had the opportunity to review this in advance. It was linked on our website. Um, we'll put a link in the, in the chat as well, if it's not already in there. Um, so folks can have it, um, if you want to, to take a look, but before we get into some of those details, just want to run through the, um, the rules here. So we're all on the same page. Um, <clears throat> so much like the board slate, we will be voting on this proposed bylaw amendment as a whole, rather than piecemeal. There, you'll you'll see there are many many changes um, included. So we would be here till tomorrow morning if we went one by one. Um, <clears throat> if there are any amendments posed to this amendment that we're putting before you, then those would need to be offered by a rural Vermont member and seconded by another, then we would discuss and then we would vote on that. The final vote will be um, a single vote on the amendment as amended or not if it's not amended. <laughs> um, hopefully that's clear enough for folks. Uh, again, we've mentioned this, this rural Vermont members are those who are eligible to vote and we will use the same process that we used for the board election um, and it will be a voice vote. So yay or nay. Um, I can't see everyone's faces, but I hope that that is clear. If you have questions, um, please throw those into the, the chat about the process. 
Um, <clears throat> we are going to now move into some of the the upper level changes that have uh, have that are represented in these bylaws. So we're just going to focus on some of the highlights because there's a whole lot of, of detail. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to start by by just sharing that the last time rural Vermont's bylaws were updated was in 2015, and this was a very minor change. Uh, we uh, have all recognized for a while that we're overdue for some pretty substantial updates to more accurately reflect how rural Vermont currently functions and also just to acknowledge some larger changes that have occurred over the last couple of years. Um, <clears throat> so to start out, one of these changes that we are proposing including in the bylaws, um, you will see show up in the beginning um, in the purpose section, we'd like to insert rural Vermont's refreshed, updated vision and mission. Um, these, these two statements came about through some work, a lot of work <laughs> that Julie mentioned in her introductory remarks um, that began about a year and a half ago or so. Um, <clears throat> the board and the staff worked diligently to draft a strategic plan for rural Vermont, a five-year plan. Um, and I see Emma's Drop the link to that in the chat if you want to take a look. Um, <clears throat> and before we could get to the point that we were ready to really identify what those strategic goals look like for rural Vermont, we felt it necessary to dig into our identity a little more, to revisit that and to um, articulate it and define it in a way that better captures uh, who rural Vermont is and um, how we do our work and what the world we are working towards looks like to us. So the board, the staff <clears throat> spent many, many hours in conversation, um, wordsmithing, went through multiple drafts, lots of meetings, um, and we're really excited um, to share with you all where we've landed. So I am going to read our Rural Vermont's updated vision, which again is um, <clears throat> our, our hope for the, the future. And that is, rural Vermont envisions a just and equitable world rooted in reverence for the earth and dignity for all. This abundant and generous way of life celebrates our diversity and interdependence in which communities of microorganisms, animals, plants, and animals tend one another and nurture generations to come. And then moving on rural Vermont's Updated mission, this is how we do the work to achieve that vision, reads like this. Rural Vermont organizes, educates, and advocates in collaboration with local and global movements to strengthen the social, ecological, and economic health of the agrarian communities that connect us all. We're excited to be sharing this with you all tonight and to be proposing that we insert um, <clears throat> these statements into rural Vermont's bylaws. Um, <clears throat> there's another change that I am going to share a little bit about here, um, which may be old news to, to some of you, um, but this is um, pretty notable in terms of um, sorry, this is John Turner calling. Um, I can't talk to him right now. Um, okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, John apparently is trying to get into the meeting. I don't know if someone else can can help him, um, but hopefully he will be able to, to join us. Um, <clears throat> so rural Vermont, um, a notable change in the bylaws is that we are formalizing the sociocratic governance structure that we've had in place since 2018. Again, this is something that might be familiar to, um, to some of you because we did introduce this idea last year and been operating in this way for a couple of years now. Um, what this means is that we've transitioned from a more traditional hierarchical sort of um, organizational structure to one that is um, horizontal and, and rests on principles of equity, uh, transparency, and shared leadership. And this shift has been a really natural fit for rural Vermont because we've always um, been a very collaborative organization and are, and are inclined to, to work in the ways that, um, that sociocracy sort of defines um, and formally adopting 
this structure gives us some tools to really to really do it well um, and to ensure that um, <clears throat> that everyone is playing a a role. Everyone has equal voice, um, and um, it's it's also for us important because it it sociocracy mirrors the structures that we'd really like to see in the world around us. Um, <clears throat> if you're curious um, about what that organizational structure looks like in practice, sort of on the ground at Rural Vermont, we just created um, in the context of our strategic plan. Um, so if you look at that, you will see that we have an organizational chart that, um, that details the different um, committees that we term circles um, and, and how those overlap. I won't spend time, too much time getting into that right now um, in the interest of time and that we're focused on the bylaws. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Emma to share some more highlights and changes that we're discussing. Thanks. Thanks, Shelby. Um, so as Shelby spoke to um, between our transition to sociocracy and our new strategic plan, mission, and vision seemed like a natural time to make updates to our bylaws. And hopefully you've had a chance to review those changes, um, but we're just gonna provide a brief summary right now. So first, you'll see that a lot of the changes are technical in nature, um, capitalizing proper nouns, using more consistent terminology and modernizing some of the communication language. Um, we also update, made updates to reflect our current practices, particularly stemming from our adoption of sociocracy, such as in the section, the section seven, that describes our sociocracy governance structure and the staff section as well. Um, and then there are also changes to the membership section that were made to explicitly reflect our current practice. Um, as Shelby said, we've included our mission and vision in the purpose section. And in the board of directors section, we've specified that we strive to be led by their agrarian community and updated term length language to support continuity but also providing flexibility and term length so commitment isn't as much of a barrier to participation. Regarding chapters, we took out language we found to be too specific, but left them as a possibility to be created at the board's discretion. We'll hear more about that later. And then lastly, we've inserted a new section that holds us accountable to our new anti-racism policy, uh, which Caroline is going to speak to now. Um, I'm having connection issues. Emma, did you just pass it over to me? I did. All right. Can you, do you have, do we have an ability to share um, what's the bylaws amendment? Do you, um, we put the link Maybe in the I chat. Have open to the Are you looking for the answer? I actually have it open too. I can just share my screen. So I'll just do. Yep, because I thought, um, I hope you guys hear me. So I'm leaving my camera off because I have connection issues. Um, but the anti-racism policy. So first of all, big tribute to <clears throat> Jameson Davis and Ariel King from Writing Wrongs LLC. They do tremendous work to make Vermont more equitable, inclusive and diverse and make Vermont institutions, organizations and businesses better places for BIPOC and society at large. And we are absolutely grateful to have been working with them on developing Rule of Vermont's anti-racism policy, which we as staff and board already had adopted back at the August board meeting. And now we're talking about with the bylaws amendment uh, and in context of the anti-racism policy about this article 11 that you see on my screen. I'm just trying to read that, even though there's parts of Zoom in the way here. Um, so Rural Vermont commits to identify, acknowledge, and eliminate all forms of racism within the organization through its anti-racism policy and subsequent procedures. These documents aim to foster diversity, equity, and inclusion through a culture of anti-racism while addressing disparities in agriculture, and are supported by Rural Vermont's beliefs outlined in our affirmation of solidarity with the movement of, for Black Lives. And the rest I actually can't read um, because something's in the way. Um, but yeah, that um, 
Oh, here. Through this reference in these bylaws, rural Vermont staff, board members, and interns are accountable to adhere to the anti-racism policy and subsequent procedures, which is um, will be the point of this paragraph. Um, the solidarity statement is also something we already had issued last year. So not everything in the anti-racism policy is new. Um, this is a preview into the policy. Um, of course, in advance to this annual meeting, we had given you the opportunity to share your feedback with us uh, through a survey. Um, haven't heard that much through that channel, but if you're interested in discussing any of the contact of this policy with us, we'll also stay on after this annual meeting for about half an hour uh, to engage in policy conversation with you and uh, surely also about this anti-racism policy. Just wanted to give you all, since we're here together for the first time with so many members, a little bit of an insight in what that policy really includes and means without speaking too much in detail about it. Um, so maybe at first, a little bit of a preview of what does it mean anti-racism? There's a definition section in the policy document and there the definition of anti-racism reads the practice of identifying, challenging and changing the value structures and behaviors that perpetuate systemic racism. And then of course you've read in, in, that, in that paragraph also that it's about um, um, accountability. Are you losing me? Can you hear me still? We're right, yeah. And that's kind of the heart, and that's kind of the heart piece of the whole policy. So while the policy document is a little bit like the vision statement, including goals and, and, and statements, the procedures document is really where to look for and uh, for answers on how we're going about these things. And what's included there is this rural Vermont accountability section. And, and that is really the place where rural Vermont staff and, and rural Vermont community is stepping up to, task, to the task to respond to notifications about direct acts of racism that are occurring within the rural Vermont community. Um, this section is basically laying out a process on how Rural Vermont would respond in, in such scenarios. And with an attempt to resolve the issue with honesty, sensitivity, and respect really through conversation and a space that we call brave spaces. And uh, also with a support structure for those that cope with race-related stresses and a non-punitive platform. And then for the worst case scenario uh, that a meeting on eye level cannot resolve any uh, such a dispute, um, our core circle may decide after due process, and that is then outlined here further down um, through the section on membership revocation and position termination, there's a process in place for the worst case scenario that a dispute cannot be resolved and that the core finds, yes, there was an, a racist act and um, either membership to Overmont has to be terminated or a official staff position or board membership can maybe terminated for that reason. And that's just what I call really the hard piece of this policy because it's showing that rural Vermont is not just soft edge talking, but also uh, has the ability in the worst case scenario to express that there's uh, no tolerance for intolerance with, within rural Vermont. And, um, yeah, but today, as I said, this policy is already part of rural Vermont now. And um, today we're really more voting on these bylaws with this paragraph and why that is so important um, is because um, it demonstrates rural Vermont's commitment to our racial justice work for the long run. Because then the policy doesn't just create a structure to hold the organization accountable, but that policy itself becomes a structure ingrained in the organizational identity and as such makes, the, makes that racial justice work much more resilient to outlive individual staff and board members. And that was kind of the intent behind including it in this um, amendment this year. So with that, I pass it back to Shelby. Thanks, Caroline. I can take over here, actually. Um, so now we know this is a lot of information to take in, and we hope you did have a chance to review it in advance. Um, 
In an effort to make the most of our limited time together, we had provided a form on the registration page for folks to ask questions and provide feedback. And while we didn't receive many responses, um, we just wanted to let you know that we did seek input and also let our doors open year round. We love hearing from our members and we're always happy to chat. Um, and so that said, we will open things up for discussion before we take a vote. And again, given our li limited time, um, we're gonna be prioritizing members and ask folks to keep their comments brief as possible. Um, if you'd like to speak um, or make a comment, ask a question, um, just let us know by either putting in the chat or if you wanna just come off mute and that works, that works too. Um, not seeing anything. Oh, yes. Um, Joan had asked a question about what our definition of equitable is. And I think that that is a really good question. Um, I think our response. Um, yeah, Joan, do you want to elaborate on what different definitions you might have heard? Or what? I'm sorry. I think. Sorry, I was having a hard time hearing you, but I think, um, yeah, we're all just coming from a place of really making sure that everyone has what they need. And I don't know if any other staff wants to speak to that. Definitely a good question. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, equity, I think also has to be, I don't think we have like a blank a definition on equity there. I'm not sure if the question related to that, um, but uh, I, I would just freely answer that um, the context is important and um, there's no, no, no blank approach to, to, the, to equity, uh, but uh, the concept, um, seeing things in, in, in context um, is, is so important and uh, seeing whether a policy decision specifically is, um, is, is equitable or not. And um, that can mean different things. And I always say in, um, in, in, from a constitutional law, perspective the in the legal education world you you learn that uh, things in the same way and different things um, different um, so there's it's not that uh, treating everything the same always but also to have that context relation in in, in policy decisions specifically is is what we're concerned about thanks for framing that Caroline Great. Um, and I see Andrea Standard put in the chat saying, having been around for some of the earlier efforts by Royal Vermont to bring its operations into alignment with its values, congratulations on taking a huge step forward to do that. Congratulations and thanks. Thanks, Andrea. Um, Can I just speak for a minute, maybe? Yes, please. This is Graham, and I just wanted to go back to Joan's question, and I appreciate you asking that. And I think you know, broadly speaking, I think in our conversation around equity, and maybe we should include the definition of equity um, somewhere, um, but we're talking about one, um, the idea of equity living throughout all of these processes, um, from outcomes to how we engage with people, uh, to how we consider whether or not something is a, an issue we engage with, et cetera, um, and distinguishing between sort of, as Caroline was saying earlier, and we're, we're hearing all the one of the primary issues in Vermont, which is the broadband <laughs> access from Caroline's Angel and uh, Angel and, and Jones, but um, the, you know, equity is a 
is a means of sort of differentiating, I think, from treating everyone equally to treating everyone e equitably such that we all reach a point of equality where we're all seen, treated, um, envisioned uh, with the same degree of dignity, rights, um, freedoms, responsibilities. Um, but that doesn't mean that we that everybody comes, is positioned and starts at the same place. So equitably means thinking about how we approach folks given their positionality to enable people to reach a point of equality. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Dan. John, I hope that, that answers your question. So. Well, that was helpful, yes. And one last thing I'll just say is that I think about, you know, we think about racial equity, we think of economic equity and equity exists in all these forms. And I, in our, I don't think our policy is to distinguish one way or the other. Clearly, we have a racial equity policy and we're, we're dealing primarily with racial equity with that. But when we say equitably more broadly, where it's not defined by that adjective, we're talking about economic, racial, um, gender equity, et cetera. Are there any other questions, comments? Good thoughts on that. So do you want to make your motion? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I, I was called in at the last minute and asked to uh, make a move a, a technical amendment, as I understand it, um, so it wasn't part of the conversation, that there are places in the bylaws where we, we refer to ourselves by the cold and un, unfriendly um, name of corporation and the motion is to replace corporation with organization in article six, number one and number five and article eight, number one. And, and I thus move. Thank you. Is there a second? I second that. Thanks. This is Pat. Kat Buxton. Is there any discussion? Um, not hearing any, I suppose now would be an appropriate time to vote on the amendment to the amendment. Um, so at this time, all in favor of changing corporation to organization in those two sections specified by Sue, please say aye. 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 Are there any nays? Not hearing any. Um, and is there any further discussion before we move on to taking a vote on these changes on the original amendment? Not seeing any. Speak up if I'm missing you. Okay. Suppose with that, um, we can now move to take a vote on this amendment and. All those in favor can signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. And I have it. We have amended our bylaws. Thank you, everyone. Um, and now we can return to some more the rest of our presentation. And I'm gonna share my screen. I'll be over to you. All right. <clears throat> okay, so we wanted to spend a little time tonight um, remembering a near and dear um, member of the rural Vermont family who passed away last month. Um, we're talking about Dexter Randall, and uh, I'm sure that many of you knew him or knew of him. He left a pretty large 
legacy and impression with many of us. Um, and I'd encourage you to share your memories or any stories that you have, um, things you remember about this, this guy into the, the chat for all of us to, um, <clears throat> to reflect on. Um, Dexter was a, a lifelong and multi-generational dairy farmer in Northern Vermont. Um, and this was a, a fellow who had a really big presence. Um, he had a big laugh, a big heart, and um, he had, had big ideas. And he was a really active member of rural Vermont for essentially the organization's entire existence, um, dating back to the mid eighties. Um, he was really committed and made it part of his life's work to, um, to advocate in support of farming being a more viable and dignified livelihood for, for everyone in Vermont and beyond. And he was often in the spotlight and on the front lines of so many of rural Vermont's early campaigns and actions. And you'll see him in some of these photos here, um, milk dumps to, um, to protest low milk prices in the 80s. Did a lot of work with BST, GMOs. Um, <clears throat> he was also, um, so yeah, this is him in 2003. Um, <clears throat> He joined Rural Vermont's board in 1993, and he was on Rural Vermont's board until 2012. Um, <clears throat> I joined Rural Vermont as a staff member in 2006, and Dexter was one of the, the first Rural Vermont folks that I connected with. Um, he actually interviewed me, and I got to sit around his kitchen table over in between chores um, back in the day and pick his brain. Um, <clears throat> he was the guy that, uh, that I often called up when I needed information or support early on. Um, he was so generous with, and really reliable too, with his, his stories, his information, um, his, his memory of, of rural Vermont. Um, he was always available to chat through things that rural Vermont had been involved with, um, to update me on sort of like the policy landscape in my early days um, <clears throat> and with just general farming questions too. He was always helpful. He's, he was really an, a rural Vermont institution um, and a natural storyteller and um, so much so that we, we, we tapped him often to, to share his stories. Um, and I remember there being a stretch of time um, <clears throat> a ways back when we would bring him into the office when we were orienting new staff members and interns so that he could, could share his stories of rural Vermont campaigns and work over the, the decades that he had been involved because there was of course no better person to share those, those stories than, than the person who lived through all of them. Um, <clears throat> and we're super grateful that, we, that we've got um, a really good quality video of Dexter sharing one of those stories. Um, and this photo that's on the screen now um, is, is a snapshot of a video that we recorded um, back in 2015, actually Orca Media recorded it, I believe, um, 2015 during Rural Vermont's 30th anniversary celebration. And um, the story is about the Farmer Protection Act and is done with um, Amy Schollenberger, who was the director of rural Vermont at the time. Um, and it's a really powerful, wonderful story. And if you've got a moment um, at some point, I would encourage you all to, to check it out and hear about some of rural Vermont's history in Dexter's words. Um, so um, yeah, in closing, Dexter was an incredible guy. We loved him, we miss him, and uh, just want to thank him for all that he's contributed to rural Vermont over many, many years and for the benefit of, of farmers everywhere. So you've got a special place in our hearts. And uh, if you've got a beverage nearby and want to raise it, um, let's cheers to Dexter. Cheers to Dexter.
so with that, um, <clears throat> I'm going to pass it over to our mighty policy team, Molly Wills, Caroline Gordon, Graham Unox, Rufinoct, and they are going to share some updates on what rural Vermont has been up to. And there's a lot. All right, I'll kick us off here. I still leave my camera off for the sake of uh, hearing me. Uh, so here's some highlights from my work with Rural Vermont in 2021. Um, for those of you who don't know me, and I guess I missed out on introducing me earlier, I'm Caroline. I'm the legislative director of Rural Vermont. And here you see a picture of the poultry farmers for compost foraging. And next to me is Andrea Stander. So first of all, <laughs> big tribute to you, Andrea, former executive director, then policy consultant, basically introducing me to the organization for my first initial uh, year and a half or almost two. Um, so your great contributions to this important work, Andrea, have also uh, greatly contributed to the success of this year. Um, you're here tonight, so cheers to you and also a virtual applause to you. And uh, you want to say hi very quickly? <laughs> I, I do want to say a very quick hi, and I just want to say how thrilled I am to see Maria uh, joining the board. Uh, I, as I was thrilled when Emma joined the staff collective um, and all the seeds of work that I got the chance to be part of. Are, are really blossoming in so many wonderful ways. So, and, and all the great new board members, um, not only tonight, but um, in the last year or two is so exciting. Um, and uh, I say hello to everybody who I, I have known and worked with and I welcome and greet all of you who I have not yet had the chance to meet. So thanks. Absolutely. Good to have you, Andrea. Um, so yeah, on this picture, you see the Poultry Farmers for Compost Foraging celebrating the passage of Act 41 um, at Vermont Compost. Uh, so that act, or formerly S-102, our bill uh, back in the race uh, the last year, um, is what now defines on-farm composting of food residuals as farming. And I will post in the chat, just for the fun of it, a link to the um, Act 250 law. And uh, for those of you who, are, who like to, um, I, I know I have to paste the link again, um, have fun with that. Um, you can just scroll through that very long provision of definitions in Act 250 and see if you find the definition of farming. It's number 22. And in there, you can then find that now compost foraging or the unfarmed composting of food residuals, uh, including the foraging of hens on the compost in that definition. So now, big steps towards making more closed loop systems and a decentral way of generating a clean resource that can be used to enhance Vermont uh, soils on farms and to raise poultry um, with this act. Um, so the next year we continue our coalition with the Poultry Farmers for Compost Foraging, Vermonters for a Clean Environment, John is also on the picture, uh, VPER, Conservation Law Foundation, on protecting the universal recycling law which will mean we demand the implementation of source separation and also the management hierarchy for organics um, and, and hope to make grain grounds, uh, grounds there next year. And then we work with the poultry farmers uh, towards rulemaking. Um, that'll happen with the Agency of Agriculture and officially launch in January, so coming up very soon. And with that, um, I'll, I'll move on to the next picture, please. So here you see Liz Roma from Roma's Butchery in South Wilton. Liz and her husband Russell have a poultry CSA farm putting down roots. And Liz also just started her own custom butcher shop last year. Um, and last Saturday, we had the second of two poultry slaughter and processing workshops. And we're also thinking about doing a series of just butcher workshops throughout the winter so that customers of unfarm slaughtered poultry can really learn how to support their local farmers who do unfarm slaughter of poultry 
And that means that they can only sell whole birds. So it's important for customers to learn how to butcher them. Um, next picture, please. And here you see Mary Lake uh, at a, our recent workshop at Stratford Village Farm. Um, so Mary and Liz are both really great educators and uh, receive interest from consumers, homesteaders and small scale producers alike uh, for advancing their meat processing skills. Uh, Liz and Mary uh, Lake both testified during the last legislative session on behalf of the successful doubling of the allowances for on farm slaughter livestock. And some of you might also remember that last session, we finally got rid of the sunset provision, which had cursed the unfarmed slaughter law to cease to exist in the past. But now the practice is actually more secure as a solid institution in Vermont's agricultural law. And that is also just better reflecting what's happening on the ground. Um, so next year, we hope to expand the workshop series with an on-farm slaughter demo of beef and potentially also with rabbits. And in the legislative session, we'll be working towards allowing for the CSA with animal shares, something that we at Rural Vermont think is already legal, but it will be worthwhile having clarity around that. Uh, so stay tuned. And we are also aiming probably to improve the marketability of on-farm slaughtered poultry. And I'll post in the chat now that there's one more slaughter workshop coming up December 5th and up in St. Albans. Um, so if you're interested, um, please register for that or, or share the info uh, with, with who, who might be interested. Um, with that, I'll pass it on to Molly. Thanks, Caroline. Um, I'm Molly Wills, our grassroots organizer, and it's really nice to see a lot of familiar faces here tonight, and thank you so much, everyone, for hanging through our business. Um, we're going to have opportunities to answer questions. I see a couple of things that have come up in the chat, um, so hang on. After our update of what we've been working on, we'll definitely talk a little bit about the future. Um, and this year was a really big year for raw milk. So I think we're going to start there. And we worked with a leadership team of really amazing producers from around the state uh, to pass a bill that allows for the sale of raw milk by tier two producers at other farms, farm stands, and CSAs within Vermont. Um, and so this bill significantly increases access to raw milk consumers and also economic opportunity for farmers. And I think it's worth noting that this bill faced a really extreme amount of opposition at just about every step of the way. Uh, and it's also a unicorn piece of legislation in the sense that it actually ended up passing in better shape than it was introduced. Um, so just a big thank you to our farmer leadership team for making that happen and ensuring raw milk laws and regulations are fair to farmers and their communities is definitely an ongoing priority for us moving forward and part of our food sovereignty work in general. And these photos are of us celebrating at Donegan Family Farm in Charlotte. Um, at the victory that we got that went into effect on July 1st of this year. Um, we've also been spending a fair amount of time on healthcare. That has been an issue that's continually raised by our community as something that's very impactful um, and impacting them every day. And so we continue working to bring agricultural voices and experiences into Vermont healthcare regulatory spaces. And we're building intersectional allies and in a early stage coalition um, with a really broad based group of folks that are all sharing the goal about increasing affordability of and access to healthcare in the state. Um, and in general, we're really working to highlight healthcare, childcare, and elder care as significant and really critical issues that are impacting the agricultural community. Uh, we've been working with the Vermont Worker Center, as you can see in this photo here, um, who led this recent sign-on effort to the legislature, asking them to fulfill their obligations around universal public health care. Um, and we're, last spring, we're also part of a successful coalition supporting H430, um, which expanded Dr. Dinosaur Healthcare to include income eligible pregnant people and children, regardless of immigration status. So that was a victory, and we definitely look to our allies at Vermont Legal Aid and Migrant Justice for that one. Um, we can move on to the next slide, please. We saw a bunch of you out and about this summer. We were sort of crisscrossing the state, um, touring farmers markets and community events, 
sharing information and making art uh, while we built relationships with folks on the ground. And so this is our all-star grassroots organizing intern, Olivia St. Pierre. Um, this is at the Barnard Feast and Field Market. And the next photo, you can see this is Royal Vermont staff member, Emma, at the Regeneration Fair in South Royalton. And here she's helping spread the word about Regeneration Corps, which is a growing educational initiative that we're psyched to be part of that helps get high school students out of the classroom onto farms, learning about the intersections of agroecology, racial justice, and climate change, um, all for academic credit. And so Regeneration Corps is a partnership between many organizations, including Grow More, Waste Less, um, Let's Grow Kids, Bale, the Grassroots Center, Farm to Plate, and a whole bunch more. And we're really proud to be um, supporting these leaders as they expand their reach into more schools across the state. We'll go to the next photo. So one of the uh, most exciting things that I've been working on recently is with a group of folks who have interest in potentially starting a pilot chapter of rural Vermont in their community. Um, so this was at a September meeting where a group of over 40 of us gathered at Crosmolita Farm in East Corinth uh, to share a meal and chat about how a local chapter of rural Vermont can support community initiatives. Um, ideas that came up were things like a tool library, a farm mentorship program and land access issues, uh, all while helping inform rural Vermont's grassroots priorities and strengthening our overall social mycelium. So this is an ongoing conversation with grassroots leaders and community members, and we look forward to sharing more soon as this project develops. And if you live in the Corinth area or are interested in learning more about the chapter idea in general, uh, we hope that you will get in touch. This fall, um, we again collaborated with, I think it was over a dozen this year, food and ag nonprofits across the state for the fourth annual State House to Farmhouse. And this event brings legislators and regulators directly onto farms in their districts to hear from farmers about what's impacting them. And this year we were really honored to partner with New Farms for New Americans in Burlington. And we got to hear directly from the New American agricultural community about their needs and their goals. And it poured with rain and we all huddled under a shelter and ate a bunch of watermelon. Um, and there was three different interpreters that helped facilitate conversations with farmers and policymakers. And just a couple of weeks ago, we hosted and co-hosted a couple of stops on Migrant Justice's Milk with Dignity tour. And we continue to support their leadership in pursuit of human rights throughout the supply chain and also to amplify how this program really supports farm workers and farm owners alike, and is a totally vital step in the future of our dairy economy. And in a nutshell, we're meeting folks where they're at and we're doing everything that we can to stay connected uh, to our grassroots community during a time where it's super hard to get together. And we're always open to ideas about how we can better learn and meet with folks, connect and share ideas. Um, this is a photo from just a couple days ago with a few members of La Via Campesina that were from Massachusetts and one farmer from Ontario, um, as well as a number of leaders from Vermont um, talking about how we can best support young people in agroecology and learn from and share with each other and continue to build a movement um, of active and engaged land stewards. And Rural Vermont is a member of La Via Campesina through our membership with the National Family Farm Coalition. And because we are a membership organization, um, every member of rural Vermont is also a member of La Via Campesina. So just wanted you all to be aware of that as well. And if you ever want to hear from us or share with us, just know it's an open door and we would love your feedback. We'd love to have a conversation. We'd love to come sit around a fire with you. Um, and please don't hesitate to be in touch. And I'll pass it on to Graham. Hey, everybody. My name is Graham Unings Tarufnacht, and I am the policy director here at Rural Vermont. And I'm just going to do my best to envision you all in person as at one of our more quote unquote normal annual meetings somewhere in Vermont, uh, all enjoying each other's company a little more viscerally. <laughs> um, but I want to take a second, I don't have much time, but I also want to just really applaud Caroline and and Molly for their incredible work over the last year and just my appreciation them as colleagues as well as you know Shelby and Emma as well but we're in the policy and organizing session section so I just wanted to 
to give them a shout out and just recognize that, as Molly said, like that raw milk legislation, that arm farm slaughter legislation, that poultry foraging legislation, those are all efforts that we are gradually building on year after year. Um, and it, they really are, you know, significant wins. I got in trouble with the state for on farm slaughter in 2012 or 2013. And now there's a path for basically doing what I was doing legally. Um, that's a big change. So I'll stop there. And speaking of on-farm slaughter, um, this is a picture of some of my animals uh, here in, in on Lee Land in Calais, Vermont. And one of the issues I was working on this last year, <laughs> yeah, Joan, let's see Joan's tag there. And, and Joan was one of the one of the farmers supporting this group. Um, we know for Vermont, rural Vermont, and many farmers and, and service providers um, sought to ensure that existing animal welfare standards related to adequate shelter requirements. Uh, for livestock in Vermont did not prohibit appropriate grazing and livestock management. We proposed alternative language based on the National Organic Program. Uh, although our language wasn't accepted um, based on our advocacy, the Senate Agricultural Committee did include language in a related bill which clarified that accepted animal husbandry, husbandry, husbandry practices will not be subject to the adequate shelter requirements, which basically meant that grazers will not be subject to violations of animal welfare if their animals do not have access to shade and shelter at all times. Um, and that's not necessarily the best solution. We'd love to see like a, an awesome, you know, articulated animal welfare, um, you know, matrix. But, you know, this is this at least for the time being ameliorated some of our concerns that folks wouldn't be inappropriately um, prosecuted or otherwise for, for animal abuse. On to the next slide. Um, Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition. So since 2018, rural Vermont's been um, making some comments on Vermont's uh, recreational cannabis law. And in 2020, in the springtime, we formed an alliance, a coalition with the North Sea, with NOFA Vermont, with the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, with Justice for All, with the Vermont Growers Association, and um, at the time with Trace, which is the uh, seed to sale tracking system of the Vermont hemp program and its co-founder is still in our coalition. And our goal is really to make sure that this coming economy is gonna be racially just, economically equitable and agriculturally accessible um, for folks in Vermont, for small businesses, for farmers, um, et cetera. On to the next slide. This slide sort of speaks to some of our stronger local collaborations. I just wanted to give name to. Um, at Farm to Plate, I have chaired the Farmland Access and Stewardship Working Group for a couple of years. I sit on the steering committee. Caroline and I both sit on their meat processing working group, which if you are someone dealing with meat processing in Vermont, you are familiar with a number of the issues that have surfaced throughout the pandemic, but which are also sort of perennial challenges with um, this part of the supply chain. We also participate in Agroforestry Working Group and contributed a lot to the Ag Strategic Plan. Uh, and going forward, Farm to Plate is really going to be all about implementing that plan. Um, we have Rooted in Vermont and Vermont Fish and Wildlife here as well, because rural Vermont is now a partner. Um, thank you, Shelby, for so much of your work in particular in facilitating this in a program called Vermont Wild Kitchen. And if you haven't seen this, check it out. This is basically a collaboration through us and these organizations trying to um, combine the links between the cultivated environment, like on farms, but also the wild harvesting environment from, from venison to bear, to wild mushrooms, to trout, et cetera, and, and bringing it all to one place where it's, it's in these really fun YouTube sort of, how do you prepare this food? Pretty short and fun videos. Um, you can learn more about where to find that uh, in the commentary at the end here, if you have a question. Our next slide um, names some of our national and international coalitions and alliances. And I think it's really important to, as you notice in our mission and vision, we've, we're really starting to re-strengthen our commitments to these organizations. Um, we now serve on the board as well as the executive committee of the National Family Farm Coalition. Uh, as Molly said, she's a liaison to La Via Campesina right now for our organization. Uh, Caroline has been interfacing with the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance. And we are also um, a plaintiff in a lawsuit filed by the Center for Food Safety, which challenges the federal guidelines on GMO labeling. And this is ongoing. And we can certainly talk more about this going forward, but on to the next slide. This is sort of our and what's left slide. So given we're running a little behind, I'm, I'm not gonna say too much about these things, but clearly we've been doing a lot of work outside of the session. 
um, and that, that you haven't seen in these photos. It's been a time that's been hard to capture great photos because a lot of our work is remote right now, for better or for worse still. Um, so supporting farmers impacted by the Horizon Danone decision. Uh, we've been monitoring and participating in the Climate Council Agricultural and Ecosystem Subcommittee, um, just trying to get our comments in there and just make sure that works for folks. The Vermont Soil Health Payment for Ecosystem Services Working Group and Associated Working Groups. Caroline can speak more of that at the end and on and on. Um, so check out that slide. I'm happy to, we are happy to talk more about this at the end of the meeting when you all have questions. Um, on to the next slide. And there you are. That's our contact information as people have been very clear to say, we wanna hear from you. We love hearing from you. Um, you know, we're here to, to really work with you to make changes in support of a, a better place for us all to be here in Vermont as, as farmers, as eaters, as homesteaders, whatever our position is um, as people in this place. And I think I will pass it back then to Shelby. Thanks, Graham. Uh, and and Molly and Caroline uh, for providing all the, all the good content, all the stuff that people I'm sure are gonna have questions about and want to talk more about. So I'm gonna be brief here. We've still got about 15 minutes um, set aside for this meeting, but the, the staff is um, absolutely willing and planning to stay on a little bit later till 8.15 or so for those who want to, to linger and ask more questions or engage in conversation, share your ideas. Um, before we get into that, just wanted to make a few closing remarks. Um, wanted to express our gratitude for all of you being here with us tonight. Um, fingers crossed that next year we will be together in person and it will be a different sort of meeting. Um, <clears throat> With a more with a lot more celebrating and um, <laughs> just a different feel. I'm sure we're all very zoomed out. Um, I also want to thank Rural Vermont's lead partner members for sponsoring tonight's event. Um, so this includes Action Circles, Rabble Rouser, and Meadows Beef Farm. Um, check them out if you're unfamiliar with any of them. They do great work, and we're grateful to have their support. Um, <clears throat> And I also want to extend a, a big thank you to all of our, our board members um, who are here tonight, who, who work really hard alongside us to, to get a lot of this work done over the years. And we're so thankful for all of your wisdom and your time and creativity and your enthusiasm uh, and support. We love you all. And, and big thanks to Chris and to Julie for, um, for participating. Um, tonight in facilitating this, this meeting. Um, so I'm going to turn it back to our policy team for, uh, to answer questions and um, to move things forward. But first, um, we can't let this meeting, uh, <laughs> you don't have to keep the slide up, but um, anyhow, if folks are willing and able to donate to Rural Vermont, we of course would really welcome your support. Um, you might know this, but Rural Vermont, does not accept government funds, um, nor do we take money from most corporations. And we really rely on our members and individual supporters and small businesses um, to fund all of that work, the majority of that work that Caroline, Molly, and, and Graham were sharing just now. Um, we're about to launch our biggest and most important fundraiser of the year, our year-end appeal. Um, you can help us get that started in a really solid place if you're able and willing to to donate um we'll put the link to do so in the chat um if you're if you're able um membership is 35 dollars for anyone who is not a member um and anything folks are able to contribute is very much appreciated and uh we put it to good to good use um so i'm gonna wrap it up there and pass it off to the policy folk. Thank you, Shelby. And, and I thought this last slide that Graham has shared with other ongoing work that we didn't have a chance to talk about much might be nice to keep up, but we can also, it's also nice to see everyone. And um, maybe we can just look at that on demand. 
this is basically the end of the meeting for all of you who have, um, you know, want to say goodbye at this time and, and, and dive into their evening. Um, that's absolutely fine. We understand that. But those of you who want to hang out and uh, ask us some questions or share some comments, share some feedback, um, you know, this is really open time um, just for us to, 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 to share some quality time virtually. And so I'll um, open the floor. We don't have a really good system for that. And I'm not sure maybe Graham and Molly, do you want to add anything before we see who unmutes themselves <laughs> next? <laughs> All I was going to say is, you know, we're happy to take questions from you about our work. We'd also love hearing, you know, what's going on in your community, on your farm, in your family that's important to you that you think is, is, is something that we should know about at Earl Vermont. I'd like to ask if anybody's working on parking the chicken and also for milk making cheese and yogurt out of raw milk. Are we are we working on making cheese and yogurt out of raw milk? I think I was that Joan? Yeah, uh-huh. Awesome. I think, Joan, I'm just going to restate what I think I heard you say, because there was a little, it was a little, came through a little garbled at the beginning, but I think you had questions, one, about um, work towards allowing farmers to process their own chickens from on-farm slaughter for sale, and the yeah. other was value-added products for raw milk. Yeah. Um, I can speak to the second half of that question regarding raw milk, and thanks for speaking up, Joan. Um, that's definitely an issue that has continually been raised by our farmer leadership team, um, at least for the last 10 years, as being something that would be incredibly economically supportive for raw milk producers and also something that um, customers are really wanting to have access to. And, and unfortunately, it's been a tough sell in the legislature lately, and we face a decent to very stiff amount of opposition um, around that piece in particular. Um, and so we're constantly working with our team of uh, raw milk leaders and guidance farmers that help us um, walk the right line and also weighing what we have um, the potential to actually change because every time we open raw milk legislation we know that there's a huge amount of opposition and we actually run the risk of the law becoming uh, more restrictive and less fair to producers than we started out with. Um, so there's a lot of strategy that goes into this work and we definitely, we just, I want to hear you and really recognize that um, that's a big one. And it's certainly something that's on our list for future. Uh, and as the climate continues to change and we share more information and education around raw milk, and the longer that these expansions to the law have a really positive track record, all of that is really wonderful um, fodder and, and makes a great case for us continuing to make expansions like this into the future. So let's stay in touch. We're definitely still going to work on this issue and we're really happy to have you here. Has anyone asked for the safety statistics for raw milk consumption? Because farmers, of course, eat these products. I'm having a hard time hearing you, Joan. I would love to answer your question. I'm not sure if you're able to use the chat, um, but we could see that the audio is just a little bit hard to hear. Carolyn, do you want to address Joan's question all about the poultry? processing. I think maybe, it sounds maybe. like I think Caroline's been having connectivity issues all evening. Um, yeah. I think I mean, I, I just issues. didn't hear I, I just didn't hear the question yet. I think Molly asked for posting the question in the chat and I, I was sort of also waiting to see if something pops up um, or did Graham, did you understand the question? Yeah, and I think Joan did, uh, she wrote it earlier in the chat during the meeting. It was a question about um, being excited to see the workshops around the poultry processing from the consumer end, but wondering if there's gonna be a push or if there's, if folks have asked from farmers have asked for a push to push for the allowance of farmers processing their own chickens for sale from on-farm slaughtered poultry. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And we have had 
discussions about that a little bit recently. Um, that is one of two asks we're debating. Um, and of the two, it is the more difficult one because processing on farms would have to come with a certain sanitary standard. And um, it'll still not lead to the meat uh, being inspected. And, and therefore it's a, it's, a, it's a whole big, difficult new arena to step into having on-farm processing of any meat, whether that's poultry or livestock. And since we will approach that CSA with animal shares now in this, you know, it's also the second half of our biennium, which means we only have one term left, one year left to get something passed. So it's strategically not a good time to introduce something of that scale in the legislature for debate. We also don't want to overstress the legislators' attention that they, that they share with us. Um, we think what's easier is the other ask we have on, on farm slaughtered poultry, and that is just to increase the marketability. And that would mean to have uh, maybe an allowance for retail sale of on-farm slaughtered poultry or other people, people's farm stands uh, be allowed to sell on-farm slaughtered poultry. I think that is a good argument to be made because it's already legal for restaurants to offer on-farm slaughtered poultry. And it's also now, as you know, um, for raw milk possible to be sold through other people's farm stands. So that might be the easier lift. And that might be something we can easily advocate for on the side of also having that debate on uh, on the CSAs for with animal shares for the livestock uh, that is slaughtered on farms. Uh, and then that gives us just a whole nother year, and that is next year, to really have more of an in-depth conversation with who is actually interested in on-farm processing of poultry so that farmers may be able to sell uninspected cuts uh, but we would also have to carefully really think about what that then means in terms of sanitary requirements that come that that both that farmers might have to face. Um, that's yeah, it is a conversation we had a little bit, and and Liz Roma from Roma's Butchery had 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 opinions to share about that, and 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 one of that was that it's probably much more difficult than talking marketability. I just want to say, I saw Lee had a question earlier about um, rabies vaccination in cattle and potentially um, other ruminant livestock. And I, I, I'm not sure if that concern has surfaced before, but we can certainly add it to our list and um, happy to hear you speak more to that as well if you want to. Great, thank you. Well, first of all, Andrea, I wanted to say hi to you. And uh, Caroline, I wanted to say hi to you. I'm getting to know a lot of you. Uh, Shelby, I've known you for a long time, so hello. Um, I just came from Texas. Hi, and I, met, I met with the Farm to Legal uh, Defense Fund. They thought I had, and, and Pete Kennedy from the Raw Milk, whatever that organization is, they thought I had a really good case. And um, I just was wondering how I might find other farmers that might want to join on this case with me. Um, they said maybe they could help defend me, um, get a defendant, or, or sorry, they might help a lawyer, help me get a lawyer, or uh, the Vermont Law School might help me get a lawyer. So that was one thing, and then I have a whole another thing, and that's for my raw milk um, micro dairy. I, mean, I only milk two cows, so um, I've read the whole statute, and it's 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 fascinating. I want to thank you for your help. Um, but I have another thing, uh, another request from rural Vermont. Will you be hosting uh, any Zoom classes? I think you did one last year that really walked us through all the protocols for um, on-farm slaughter um, and what the legalities are in that. Because didn't you do that last year, like a really long, like three-hour class? Well, it was a it was a forum that we got the agency of agriculture to host. Yeah, that, that nice. video is still online on the agency's website. I'm not sure if it's if it's if it's helpful. You you know, look at it and let me. I'm happy to find the link here as we talk and post it in the chat for you. And 
if you want to check that out, it would be very helpful for us to know how helpful we, um, that appears. We did it. We attended it and we thought it was, we thought it was great. It's just, it's a lot to do. We had three of us and we were working on it. Um, it's just a lot to do. We think we've done most of it. You know, and, and if you still have open questions, that's the thing we do. Uh, we open, we, we answer any policy inquiries on an ongoing basis. So if you, if it's really for you an implementation question that you don't want to ask the agency directly. So how does your farm comply with the on-farm slaughter law for, for livestock? Do you meet the requirements? We can talk through that just amongst us and see, you know, I can share with you what I know about the law and we can hear what you do. And if there's any concern or discrepancies that I see and there's an open question that we might not resolve, I'm happy to call the agency on your behalf and, and see, see what, what their response is so you can stay anonymous and don't have to reveal your situation. <laughs> um, if, if that's fa if, if that's favorable and um, so even and, and and that that would be my first approach you know we can do that anytime I'm not sure if we will do a virtual forum on on farm slaughter guidance um, during the legislative session but but I, I appreciate that feedback and that is certainly something we should consider organizing also and that um, I appreciate you saying that that virtual format was helpful. Um, right. we're just, we're it just was, also on, um, there's, a, a, you know, why we don't do that. Like we, we, we ask the agency to issue guidance because there's actually some gray zones in the law where there's also really hard to know if you're doing it correctly or not. And so our stance is there's a lot of legal uncertainty related to the law. And it's actually the agency, the ones who have to give us guidance and tell us what is right and what is wrong. And the agency now we discovered is actually openly uh, in the unknown about what is correct and not um, under the federal allowance. So we actually are in the middle of discovering with the agency themselves through direct conversations with FSIS, what is permissible or not for states within their on-farm slaughter laws, um, so that the agency themselves are a little more decisive with producers on, on, on what they can or can't do, and that producers like you don't have to be in the gray about if they're doing it correct or not. Um, so we, we, that's if you join our on-farm slaughter um, group, um, be in touch with me. Again, I put my email in the in the chat. I'll send updates on that um, because um, we really we know that there's a need for for more clarity. And um, right now, it's all individual inquiries and individual consulting. Um, because what we think is the law at Wolvermont is, is, is in discrepancy to what the agency puts out there. And that's not a good situation to be had. Thank you. Hi, Carol, Recording are, stopped. Are you, are you all um, in support of the Prime Act? Yes? Yes. I didn't hear the question. My my I, my computer was too slow. Can you repeat that, Lee? Are you uh, is rural Vermont in favor of the Prime Act? We are co-sign. We co-sign. This is work. The, all the federal work. We are in coalition with the National Family Farm Coalition, who basically shepherd that advocacy on the federal level. So we always sign. We sign. We sign what they share. Right. Thank you. I think I saw that Gloria raised her hand earlier. Yeah, I did. Is my microphone working? Yeah. I can see Gloria. I'm just curiously what your your problem is with the rabies shots because i sell raw milk and frankly we were vaccinating before it was even required because we had rabid animals in our pasture i would never ever not vaccinate so so i'm, I'm just really curious what what your concern is with it uh we're biodynamic farmers 
And we haven't seen any rabies anywhere. Vermont is one of the only states, if not the only state in the country to require this. And we don't think it's necessary at all. The only way you would ever get milk into um, a customer's bottle is if you, um, that, if you uh, were milking a rabid cow, which would not happen. Um, yeah, I get that, but I, I, I won't get it. Well, I'm sorry, you asked me, Gloria, do you want me to answer? Should an animal become rabid, it has, it has no consequence. It wouldn't harm the farmer unless they stuck their hand down their throat. I mean, I've read the whole statute. It's well, not- Because I have a friend who was attacked by a rabid cow, got trampled. I, I'm more worried about my cow losing a good cow. I, I'm not, I don't have a big herd. So, um, you know, twice we had a rabid raccoon, we had a rabid fox. I Well, you must live in the Western part of the state because I've only been about three or four accounts of this in the past 15 years. So that must have been your farm. Yeah, no, I live in, I live on the, right along the Connecticut River. Um, I, I'm just curious, like you said, why, what you find the issue is. Well, we're just biodynamic farmers. It doesn't go along with organic farming. Okay. okay. I'd like to talk to you more about this. Sure. Great. No, and from our perspective at Real Vermont, I appreciate the question, Gloria, because it's just helpful to hear different people's perspectives. And, you know, from both of you, you're both welcome to call and inform us more and we can have these conversations. Yeah, I just didn't realize, like you said, I didn't, I don't think I realized it was, um, don't want to use biodynamic or organic standards, whatever. Well, it's a thousand dollar fine a day if you do not do what the um, state health department asks and i don't think it's that relevant right. oh I, I get it and i never i never thought it was important myself until we had a call the state the first time to come and retrieve the rabid raccoon from my cow pasture and then all of a sudden you haven't and you, you've been attacked by a rabid cow yourself no i haven't but somebody i know their brother on a dairy farm was um, and I said, how did you know it was rabbit? She said, well, we didn't know until it went after her brother and then they had to have it. I, I don't know. I don't remember the whole story, but she told me about it. I was like, oh, okay. But I, I just don't want to lose a cow. That was my concern. Well, you can put a rabbit, a rabbit cow can go into isolation and then you can watch it and treat it. Okay. Well, did that ever happen to one of your cows, which is very, very unlikely, but should it happen, you can you can isolate it. But anyway, okay. we're we're probably taking up too much time. You know, I'd be glad to talk to you about this another time. I'd love to hear more about it then. That's been our only concern is twice. So you know, we figured we were pushing our luck. Well, look look at the statute. Um, they they describe all the cases. It's it's interesting. Okay. Thank you both so much much for sharing and for the dialogue. I really appreciate a very respectful back and forth discourse. Um, and I'd encourage you to use the chat to you can privately message each other with contact information um, or publicly or if you want to invite others to join this conversation. Um, and then I'd like to open things up. So we've talked a lot about what rural Vermont has done over the past year. And we have a lot of ideas for what's to come. And we also want to hear from you. And so just encourage you all to um, use the opportunity of having us here at your beck and command to answer any questions or concerns or thoughts and ideas that you might have. And folks can use the chat and um, other, if folks don't have immediate questions, then maybe Caroline and Graham, you could talk a little bit about uh, what's down the road legislatively that folks might be interested in hearing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Sure. So yeah, of course, the next legislative session is ahead of us, only a couple of weeks till January. <laughs> and we're also not quite sure yet how it will look like. If it will be uh, in, all in person is very unlikely. So it will be some sort of hybrid, I'm sure. Um, Amy Schallenberger is also on the call. So maybe Amy, if you want to chat what you know, that will be, I'm sure, of interest of, of folks. Um, but assuming it'll be hybrid, I will surely make my way back into the state house being fully vaccinated i'm looking forward to in-person contact with legislators uh, as it is sort of essential for for the for the for the work we're trying to do um, that was really a challenge in the last year um, and we're looking forward to the advancements to the on-farm slaughter law that that we have outlined um, graham outlined a little bit the work of the Cannab cannabis equity coalition that we will shepherd through. Um, if folks are interested to hear more about that from Graham, I'm sure he's welcome to elaborate a little bit on that. And then also that work from the Climate Council is coming down the pipe with a lot of recommendations that we'll be interested to monitor what will be, what, what legislators will be thinking of implementing uh, from, from those recommendations now. Uh, um, and, and so there will be lots of discourse happen uh, around that. And then also about the ACT strategic plan that the Farm to Plate Network has put together. The, the whole network is in an in, in reorganizing mood. Um, so all, 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 all eyes on how to implement the plan. And that also will have some legislative consequences, I'm sure. So we'll be really eager to engage with that. Um, and and, and aside from that, uh, I must say, honestly, there's also going to happen a lot outside of the legislative process for rule of Vermont next year. There's a lot of rulemaking happening. As I mentioned earlier, there's the compost rules, there's the re uh, amendments of the required agricultural practice rules. Um, then there's the cannabis rules. And um, then we also advocate for a agency of natural resource to do rulemaking on depackaging uh, technology. Um, so um, altogether, um, rulemaking and legislative process will be, will be quite a focus for the next couple of months. And um, of course, and then aside from that, there's a lot of partner organizations that we support, that we also support with our advocacy, whether that is Milford Vermont's agenda, whether that is Michael Justice's agenda, whether that's the Neighbors Network's agenda, um, whether that is uh, in, in indigenous uh, laws um, that, that, might, that gain some traction potentially next session. So we stay tuned elsewhere too. Um, um, farm to school will we'll have an agenda that we'll be supporting. Um, so so it's it's in many ways also time for for fostering collaboration um, uh, where possible uh, to get things done. I thought I'd just chime in quickly here to because I saw Lee's question on um, Horizon Danone um, and sort of what's going on with that as well. And, and I'm happy if, for Molly or, or others also to chime in here, but I'll try to give a, a quick roundup of, of some of the work that Rural Vermont's been doing around that. And I'd say one, you know, our primary concern is, is these farmers themselves right now in their situation. They're clearly in a very vulnerable place. Their, their contracts leave them very vulnerable. Um, and just knowing that they're going to lose their market um, next year is an incredibly vulnerable place to be in. So we've been trying doing our best to reach out to the farmers that we know in our networks or who are being put in touch with us to hear from them directly. Uh, we're also fortunate to have folks on our board and in our networks who are um, directly involved with either the organic milk market or working on the ground with farmers. Um, and we, we rely on, on and them as well for input. Um, we also have relationships with, you know, NOFA, with VOF, with regional and national groups, um, where we've been able to have some conversation. I attended the last um, dairy task force meeting convened by the Agency of Agriculture, um, where there are organic farmers, also reps from, from NOFA, from VOF, from uh, Stonyfield, et cetera, involved. And, you know, some of the primary things we've heard so far is that most of these farmers, they want sort of more or less the same, more or less to continue to have the same thing happening, which means a milk truck showing up at their farm, taking their milk, they keep producing organically, 
that would be the ideal situation for them. Uh, we heard recently you know, that Stony Fields picking up some. We don't know how many. We know Organic Valley is very interested in picking up more. We don't know how many yet. So, so we're sort of in this early stages of understanding, you know, what's going to be possible to meet those farmers' needs directly as best as possible. And that's sort of one end of things. And I'd say the other end of things is, is how we consider um, actions in relationship to Horizon Danone. And I would say corporate agriculture in, in general. Um, and, you know, in this respect, we've also been in conversations with, with migrant justice um, because it's really important for us to remember that as we're fighting for these farms, that there's also farm laborers and that organic standards don't necessarily assure just labor conditions. And if we're going to be fighting these farms, we also have to know that we are fighting for these farm workers and, you know, thinking about what's that intersection, how can we use this as an opportunity to potentially gain a lot of ground on both ends for farmers and for farm workers. Um, and, you know, so we're still relatively early in this. I know that's sort of strange to say, given the momentous, you know, how consequential the, action this was from Danone, et cetera. But um, as I said, you know, we're really trying to make sure we're not overstepping our, our boundaries and are making sure that we're not compromising farmers' safety and recognizing their vulnerability in this current situation while also recognizing, um, as we have for years in this work at Royal Vermont and our, some of our partners have, that we need to really push back against this corporate agricultural, global corporate agricultural agenda. Um, we did write a not directly related to the Dan on Horizon situation, but we did partner with the National Family Farm Coalition, Federation of Southern Cooperatives and others in writing an op-ed um, this last fall about, about the Justice for Black Farmers Act and the Relief for Small Farmers Act. That I think that article really dovetails with this situation and really shows the impact, not just of Dan Own, but of corporate agriculture in the US and globally and making those connections. So I think for us, it's important both to be focusing on this situation, but also making the connection between this situation and this particular global agribusiness, um, but also the, the nature of, of global agribusiness in general and how it affects our day-to-day -day lives as, as small farmers in the U.S., but also, as we were talking to Niels from La Via Campesina the other day, you know, small farmers across the planet in Nicaragua, in parts of Africa, and other parts of Central and South America, in Europe, et cetera, um, Canada. So... Maybe I'll leave it there and see if Molly, um, in particular, you want to add anything because Molly also, you know, works on a commodity dairy with me as well. Thanks, Graham. I think you did a really nice job of summing that up. And I think the only thing that I would add is that um, there are there are folks that are the average age of a Vermont farmer is somewhere around sixty seven, I believe. So there are a number of these farmers that are sort of at the ends of their working career and looking to potentially. Um, get out to retire, whatever it may be. But there's also a number of farmers that are in their early 30s and they have young kids and they're banking on uh, being dairy farmers for the rest of their lives and raising their children that way um, and paying their bills that way and feeding their families that way. And so these are the folks that we're really um, holding in our hearts and in our minds as we do this advocacy and do this work. Because as Graham said, we need long-term solutions. Um, we need to address the problem of corporate consolidation because even if between Organic Valley and Stonyfield, folks are able to find a market for the farmers that wish to continue milking, that doesn't get to the root of the problem. Um, it just sort of stops the immediate crises at hand. And so we recognize that there's just, with the current way that um, commodity agriculture and the corporate consolidation is set up, there's just going to be um, the same issue later down the road. And so we're really, again, looking at long-term solutions, how we can support these folks um, in a meaningful way, um, not just through this year, not through next year or the next five years or 10 years, but really long-term as part of our food sovereignty and therefore our food security. And I see your question, Lee, there about just, is there a direct protest at the moment? And I think a number of people are, are doing their individual protests and there may be organizations that are trying to collectively organize right now. And for us, we're, we're sort of in the place of trying to strategically um, group with these farmers, with other organizations to consider what that can look like, how to both keep these folks protected, but also, you know, um, have a consequential impact from our actions. So I would say, you know, keep an eye going forward, at least from rural Vermont, and keep your eyes open more broadly for, for other opportunities. But we all have the clear ability to, you know, 
to have our individual protests, but there will, I'm sure there will be more collective actions coming soon. Um, we're really just trying to make sure we have our, um, not to use a poor metaphor, but our base is covered and, and just to make sure that we, we have the appropriate players in place, et cetera, and how are part of a, part of a strategic, you know, movement that can make a difference on this. So I'd say, you know, we will be in touch more and certainly be in touch with us as well. If there's no further questions, I would say we might wrap it up here. I certainly smell dinner. <laughs> Unless there's any final comment. And then with that, I thank you all so much for hanging out another little bit with the policy team and Ruvamon. And um, come come yeah come 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 join again uh, uh, and uh, hope to see you soon in person that would be more fun for sure thank you all right have a good night everybody Bye. thanks everybody thanks